Okay, so today's lecture is on the frequency response, and I apologize in advance that this lecture kind of has a hop in the middle from when my computer restarted, so I'm re-recording the first part of it, and then you'll see the part that actually kicks in when I talk about things in front of the class in about five minutes. Okay, so like I said, frequency response. And so uh, where we started with was last time, where we said that if we have a signal that is the convolution of two other signals, there's a Fourier transform property that tells us that the Fourier transform of Y is simply the product of the two Fourier transforms, right? And as we know from signals and systems, that's a very important property. So let me just first start off by proving why that's true. Okay, so first we start off with the definition of convolution. That's this convolution integral that involves tau. And then we take the Fourier transform of this guy, which we learned last time was this integral times e to the minus j omega t dt. And now we plug in, what do we know about y of t? Well, it's this integral, x of tau, h of t minus tau, d tau, e to the minus j omega t dt. Okay. And so now we're going to do the standard trick of moving around the two integrals. So I'm going to interchange. My first integral is going to be a d tau integral, which means that I can take stuff that doesn't depend on t at all out. And my inner integral is going to be a dt integral. And now I look and I say, okay, well, this here looks like a Fourier transform itself, right? This looks like the Fourier transform of h of t minus tau. So I can kind of write this in an abbreviated way as the Fourier transform, this curly f of this time domain signal, t minus tau, d tau. And now I'm going to say, okay, well, my Fourier transform properties from last time tell me that the Fourier transform of h of t minus tau is, so here's my part from before, by definition, the Fourier transform of that shift time shifted signal is simply a phase shifted version of the Fourier transform of H, right? So here, H omega is the Fourier transform of the non shifted signal. And now I say, okay, well, this H of omega is just a constant from the perspective of this integral. And now I recognize that this thing here is simply the Fourier transform of X, right? And so that's uh, exactly where I wanted to get to, and so I've proven what I set out to. And so a lot of times we know that the reason that we care about integrals or uh, convolutions like this in the first place is that we have X is the input, H is the impulse response of the system, and Y is the output. And so in that case, we give this H of omega a special name, right? So we know from before that if I put the delta function into the system, and again, this only works for an LTI system, what comes out is this H of T that we call the impulse response. Now, we define this new thing, which is the Fourier transform of H of T, H of omega, and we call that the frequency response. And that's a very important concept. That's what kind of lets us take, um, you know, things that were complicated in the time domain and make them easier in the frequency domain. And so that's why sometimes you will see interchangeably, you know, sometimes you'll see a system written like this. And from this notation, it's kind of clear that this little h means this is the impulse response of the system. Sometimes you may also see this. where capital H of omega means that I'm dealing with the frequency response of the system, okay? And I can tell that, um, kind of putting it all together, so let's suppose I put the signal through two impulse responses, I get this output, right? I can equivalently talk about putting that signal through two frequency responses. And I know that in the frequency domain, my output 
is going to be the input frequency uh, domain times one frequency response times the other frequency response. And I know that doesn't really, you know, since this is just multiplication, there's no problem interchanging these two things. And that means that this gives me the same result. which is another way of saying that if I interchange the two impulse responses, I get the same result. And so this is just a different way of saying that we already proved, or we already knew, that changing the order of LTI systems doesn't change the result, right? So here we can see why that's true by going through the frequency domain. And now the other video will pick up and you'll learn more about it. So. Let's talk a little bit about the, the frequency response, okay? What does the frequency response mean and what does it tell us? So, what does the frequency response mean? Well, Let's think about putting an exponential, a complex exponential, into our system. This is like an arbitrary system, okay? So that means that let's suppose I take this exponential here that is a fixed frequency omega zero, okay? So then one way to think about this is uh, kind of like a phase shift of a constant. Right? All I'm doing is I'm taking my constant and I'm multiplying it by some complex number. Right? And so what is x of omega? Well, I know that a phase shift in one domain corresponds to a time shift in the other domain. And so what would be the Fourier transform of the constant? It's just going to be a delta function. Right? And so by phase shifting things in the time domain, I'm shifting that delta function around in the frequency domain. And so we can find that the Fourier transform of this thing is just a shifted delta function. Okay. And so now let's suppose that I want to know how does my system respond to this shifted, or how does my system respond to this complex sinusoid? Well, I have an arbitrary system, so I have this frequency response, and I have my Fourier transform of x, right? So here, this is going to be the frequency response of my system. Well, I don't know exactly what this does. I know what the Fourier transform of my simple input signal is. It's this. And now I can say, okay, well, you know, this is like I have some kind of arbitrary frequency response, and I'm multiplying it by a delta function that is shifted to fire at omega zero. And so the only thing that I can get when I multiply these two things is it's like I'm multiplying this delta function by whatever this complex number is, right? So the result is going to be simply whatever the value of the frequency response is at this number times 2 pi times the same delta function. Okay. And now if I undo the frequency domain to get back into the time domain, I want to know what is the corresponding output of the system. Well, you know, this here, for the purposes of the of the inverse Fourier transform, is just a constant, right? That's just some complex number. It's whatever the frequency response was at that omega zero. So what I get is this guy, and I already know what the inverse Fourier transform of this is. It's just simply the original signal I put in. Okay. So what does this mean? This is actually really important. This says that if I put a complex exponential in with a certain frequency omega zero, right? We've learned a lesson today. What comes out is the same complex exponential, just multiplied by some complex number, right? So I'm not changing anything about the frequencies in this signal, right? The only thing that's happening is I'm taking that complex exponential and multiplying it by some 
scalar, right? And that scalar has a magnitude and has a angle, right? But I'm not changing the fundamental frequency content of the signal, okay? And so that's a really key idea. That says that the system cannot introduce new frequencies into the output that weren't present in the input, okay? And kind of a corollary of that is something like this, right? So this is maybe a little bit abstract to think about in the complex world, right? But let's make things a little more concrete. So let's suppose that H of t, the impulse response, is real, which happens basically all the time in our class. And x of t is a cosine at a certain frequency. Okay, so now everything is real. That should make things a little bit easier to think about. Okay, so since the impulse response is real, we know that there are these symmetry properties of the Fourier transform, right? So for one thing, we know that um, h of omega is h of minus omega conjugate, right? This is kind of like, again, the idea that if I have, you know, 1 plus 2j on one side of the axis, I have 1 minus 2j on the other side of the axis, right? So let's think about what is the output for this signal. OK. Well, again, what is the Fourier transform of the cosine? The cosine looks like two impulses like this. Again, why is that true? Well, actually, we can kind of see it from here, right? So if the Fourier transform of this is a single impulse over here, and that has height 2 pi. I guess I should have actually over here said 2 pi was the height of this cosine, right? What I have to make up the cosine is 1 half of this plus 1 half of the thing flipped around the other side. So I get two impulses that are of height pi. And what that's going to do is it's going to take my Fourier transform, and if I kind of plot the magnitude of the Fourier transform, right, the magnitude is going to be symmetric. So it's going to be like picking off these two points on the frequency response. And so what do I get? My Fourier transform of the signal is this sum of delta functions. And then I have my frequency response. And so again, what's going to happen is I'm going to pick off for each of the delta functions the corresponding value of the frequency response. So I'm going to get pi uh, h of omega 0. That's where this delta function fires plus h of minus omega 0. That's where this delta function fires. And now I'm going to modify this a little bit to say, OK, well, I know that this thing here, by the complex you know, conjugate symmetry, is this thing, conjugate, times this delta function. And now I'm going to break this down into magnitude and phase. I'm going to say, OK, this is like pi, the magnitude of this thing, e to the j, the angle of this thing, times the delta function, plus the same magnitude here, e to the j, e to the minus j angle of this thing. And now, I kind of conclude by saying, OK, well, this looks like, uh, so now I can say that the signal that comes out when I put the cosine in is multiplied by this magnitude. Right? This is what's going to be multiplying the whole thing. And then this term plus this term is exactly what I get if I were to shift the cosine by this angle, right? Because this would be like e to the plus j this times e to the minus j this. And that's where these things come out, right? And so this tells me that, again, if I put a cosine into this real valued impulse response system, what comes out is the very same cosine multiplied by the magnitude of the frequency response and phase shifted by the angle, okay? So the cosine comes in, the same cosine comes out, perhaps amplified or attenuated and perhaps shifted around, right? But again, this is a different way of thinking about it. If the signal is made up of a 
real decomposition of cosines and sines, then I can't get any other cosines and sines out that weren't present originally. It may be that I can totally remove one of those cosines. That's like multiplying by zero, and that's okay. But for example, it would be impossible for an LTI system to <laughs> like have something like this. So, the, so this is a kind of a good question. So if this, you know, if cosine three t comes in and cosine five t comes out, I can immediately conclude this is not an LTI system, right? Because I've introduced a different frequency that wasn't present in the original signal, right? There was no cosine or sine five t in the original part. Okay, so this can't be. LTI. Okay, so any questions or comments about that? Yeah? So is something like a mixer then not an LTI system? A mixer. Could you be more specific about what that is? Where you have an input frequency and then you have an LTI system that has I guess I don't understand the audio terminology well enough to be able to give you a good answer there. Uh, so could you give me an example of like what signal comes in and what signal comes out? Like what is the like in uh, like 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 a third radio, you've mm -hmm. got your RF input, mm -hmm. you've got low velocity frequency, and that down converts into uh, intermediate frequency, which you can use for filtering. Uh, so you have a product mixture where you oh, have, I see. where you take the the sum of the difference. Good question. So let's see. You're multiplying. So it's true that when you're multiplying things, you may not have a linear system. I think the, I think that the way that that works, and I have to go back and look at it. So don't put me on this. Let me go back and read it a little bit for a second. But I think that my intuition is that the whole thing, I think, acts as a linear system, but each of those subcomponents may not be linear. But let me let me take a look at that. That's a good idea. So let me make a note of that. That was a header right? Yeah, header Right. Right. All right. Let's talk about that next time. That's a good question. Okay. So the way I want to talk about LTI systems is that the uh, frequency response is basically telling me what happens to every frequency in the signal, right? Which actually, you know, kind of stands to reason, right? And so one of the most important frequency responses or types of filters, we call them, is a low-pass filter. And so, um, you know, we often, or maybe better to say usually, interpret H omega uh, as, you know, what the system does to uh, frequencies of the input signal. And so often you will see a system kind of interchange with the word filter, right? Because what's usually happening or what's often happening is that we are taking frequencies of the input and we're damping down or fully removing certain frequencies, right? That's why you call it a filter because only certain things are passing through. And so the kind of most important of these is the low pass filter. So all this means is that if I were to sketch in the frequency response what's happening, I have a frequency response that looks like this, where it's one over this you know, range between minus omega c and omega c and zero elsewhere. And so the result of applying this to some input signal that has some arbitrary Fourier transform is that it cuts out all the frequencies that are higher than omega c. And so what I get at the end is something like this. And so this omega c 
we often call the cutoff frequency. And, you know, just in terms of terminology, we usually call this area the pass band, and this area the stop band, right? What's under the top, or what's under the filter is the pass band, what's outside of it is the stop band. And so, what would be the corresponding impulse response of the system? So we know that a pulse in one world corresponds to a sync function in the other world. And so we would expect that, and you can compute, that the corresponding impulse response is a sync function related to the cutoff frequency. And what that looks like, we talked about this a little bit last time, is something like this where I have an evenly spaced set of zero crossings, and these zero crossings occur at multiples of pi over omega c. And the height of this thing is omega c over pi. And so this illustrates kind of an important trade-off in filter design, right? This is often exactly what we want in the frequency domain, something that cuts out only what we want and throws away exactly all the rest, right? But if I think about how I'm going to actually implement this filter in the time domain, this filter here is not so great for a couple of reasons. One is that, uh, well, it's not causal, right? So it goes in both directions. Uh, that means that I'm looking into the future to filter the signal corresponding to the pieces of the impulse response there to the left of the uh, y-axis, right? So, um, the other thing is that this wiggliness, right? So it basically, even if I were to somehow truncate things, it goes out infinitely far in both directions. And so I'd have to kind of eventually stop at some point because I don't want to be using a huge delay looking back into time for thousands of signals or thousands of samples to be able to do my filtering. And also it turns out that this, this wiggliness here in the time domain causes some problems in the frequency, or causes some problems in the output in the sense that if I were to you know, use an approximation of this to filter a signal, this rippliness in the um, time domain kind of will make some rippliness in the output signal that I may not like, okay? And so I'm gonna defer a lot of these discussions about filter design until a little later in the class we're gonna talk in some detail about how do you design good filters. So in practice, you will compromise on what things look like in the frequency domain to get a better time domain filter and, and vice versa, okay? And we haven't even started to talk about, you know, the fact that everything here is still in the continuous world, whereas in real life we have to design digital filters that approximate this. And so that's what we're going to get to in the next couple lectures is first we have to define how do I do filtering in the discrete time world and then what do those filters look like? Um, so we're going to talk about that kind of coming into the next lecture, okay? All right, so instead we can think about what would be a good approximation to this kind of idealized low-pass filter, okay? So let's think about, um, we know this is a signal that you see a lot in continuous time problems, right? A decaying exponential, okay? And if you kind of compare that to this, you know, there is a similarity. There's no, you know, there's no uh, negative part, but you know, there is this kind of trend that the filter values get smaller as I go out in time. And so let's see what the Fourier transform of this guy looks like and whether it would make a good low pass filter. Well, we know from last time and from our tables that this is the Fourier transform of that time domain signal. And now what we want to know is Let's not worry about the phase for the moment. As we're going to talk about, you know, typically for filtering, the first thing we care about is the magnitude of the frequency response, right? So we usually look at the absolute value of things. We also will care about the phase, and we're going to talk about that when we talk about filter design. But let's for the moment just talk about this. What is the magnitude of this? <coughs> well, um, may not be so obvious at first. Let's just, for example, you know, multiply the top and the bottom by. Um, a minus j omega, and then it's kind of easier to see that what I have here is square root of a squared plus omega squared. So what I have is this guy here, 
I mean, you can also get to there right from here, but just to make it easier. And so as a function of omega, what does this look like? Well, in the middle, right, when omega equals zero, I have a high value here. And as omega increases, fundamentally, I'm falling off so that the magnitude of this filter goes to zero as I go farther out. And so this is a fairly crude low pass filter, right? And, you know, we could talk about how could I, you know, make the fall off of this, you know, wider or thinner. That depends on the value of A that I choose, right? So you could th think about, you know, basically the, the width of this thing depends on A. So, like I said, let me defer some discussion of advanced filter design until we actually talk about digital filters. Then we're going to talk about it a lot, and you'll be sick of it. Okay. So, there's pause and ask questions or comments about this. Okay. So, the general setup, right, to solving LTI systems, so what we would do is first we would compute uh, x of omega from x of t. <coughs> Second, we would multiply x of omega times h of omega to get y of omega. And three, we would take the inverse Fourier transform to get y of t, right? And this is generally the path of solving LTI systems. And usually, step three is the hardest part, where you've got this new thing in the frequency domain that you have to take the inverse Fourier transform of, right? And that's where we get into these things like partial fractions and so on. So what I want to do is just kind of give a quick overview of how do you actually solve LTI systems this way. And so here's an example. I have this is my input signal. I have this is my frequency response. So I can easily compute the two Fourier transforms. I multiply these things together to get my Fourier transform of the output. And this is where you stop and say, well, you know, these Fourier transform pairs were in my table, but this is not in my table as such, right? So what would I do about it? Well, we would use the method of partial fractions, where I hypothesize that I could decompose this in terms of these two things, and I would cross multiply to figure out what A and B are. In this case, I would say, okay, there's a constant term, 3A plus 5B, and then there's a J omega term. And I compare that to what I actually have. I have this has to equal 1, this has to equal 0, because there is no J omega term. And so what I get is a system, two equations and two unknowns. And so then I would say, OK, that means that B has to equal minus A. That means that over here I have 2B equals 1. That means that I have B equals a half, and A equals minus a half. Right? And so then I go back and I say, now I've written my y of omega in a way that allows me to easily undo it. Now by inspection, I can say this is my part here, and this is my part here. Right? Okay. So hopefully that's not too unfamiliar. That's kind of the standard way of solving linear systems. Um, life can get a little bit more tricky sometimes. So let's suppose that you're given the uh, time domain signal, and you're given the frequency response of the system. <coughs> 
Well, first I would figure out what things were in the frequency domain over here. Now I multiply these two things together and I would get uh, the product I got a 1 plus j omega squared times a 3 plus j omega. Okay, And so whenever you see a higher order term in the denominator, that means that you have to include the partial fractions for all of the terms before that. right? So that means that my hypothesis is I got an a over 1 plus j omega squared plus a b over 1 plus j omega plus a c over 3 plus j omega. Okay. And again, to get this to work, I would kind of multiply everything out. Here I have to have this guy. Here I have to have one of these guys and one of these guys. And here I need to have one of these guys. right? I can multiply all that stuff out. I can spare you the, the tedium. So I'm going to get basically 3a plus 3b plus c plus a plus 4b plus 2c times j omega plus b plus c times j omega squared. And now again, I would do kind of term matching to say, okay, well, I have this term here corresponds to the constant term up there. This term here corresponds to 1 times j omega. This term here corresponds to 0 because there is no j omega squared term up there. And so what I would do is I'd form another linear system where I'd say 3a plus 3b plus c equals 2, a plus 4b plus 2c equals 1, and b plus c equals 0. And so it's not going to be too hard to undo this stuff. I mean, you can immediately kind of say that, you know, uh, C equals minus B. That means that I can kind of immediately turn these guys into 3A plus 2B equals 2. A plus 2B equals 1. And from here I can subtract these two things. I get 2A equals 1. So that means that A equals a half. B equals a quarter. C equals minus a quarter. Right? So not too bad. And so now I can undo this. I can say that my y of omega is 1 half over 1 plus j omega squared plus 1 quarter over 1 plus j omega plus negative a quarter over 3 plus j omega. And that means that my y of t is going to be, you can read off from the table, that this is t e to the minus t u of t. This is my regular e to the minus t u of t. And this is my e to the minus 3t u of t. So, you know, I'm not going to ever give you on a homework or, well, maybe on a homework, not, not on an exam for sure, something that requires you to do too much crazy manual computation. I mean, this, if it didn't work out so nicely, is very easy to do in MATLAB just with a backslash operator. So, you know, these linear systems are never going to be too hard to solve. OK. So comments or questions about how I did that? So I think I only put one partial fractions problem and a relatively simple one on the homework this time because we end up using the same technique for Fourier transforms and for Z transforms. And so to really make you work on it, I'm going to probably shift those kinds of problems over to the discrete time world instead of belaboring the point in continuous time. Okay, so you're going to see more of this stuff, but not on the current homework, probably on the next homework. Okay. And so kind of the last thing I want to say about this is that um, I mentioned that you can use Fourier techniques to make solving differential equations easier. You probably already know that from um, you know taking differential equations. So we know that if I have a derivative of a signal, that the corresponding Fourier transforms are related by this element of j omega, right? And so that means that when you see some differential equation, 
like this. Right? It's much easier to take everything into the Fourier domain and say, okay, I've got a double derivative here that corresponds to a j omega squared times the Fourier transform of y. Here I have just a j omega times the Fourier transform of y. And here I have the Fourier transform of y. And over here I have a j omega times the Fourier transform of the input plus this guy. And then I could rearrange things to say that my corresponding frequency response is the output frequency response over the input frequency response, which is going to be, um, if I multiply everything out, I'm going to get a 2 plus j omega over here over a, I guess I can factor this, would be a 1 plus j omega times a 3 plus j omega. Right? So this is much easier you know, and, and then I could multiply this by whatever input I wanted to, right? Um, so this is much easier than trying to solve things with guessing the time domain solution and plugging it in and homogeneous in particular and all that stuff. So life is much easier over here. Um, and I guess the final thing I would say, just as a note, is that this whole lecture is all about saying that convolution in the time domain is the same thing as multiplication in the frequency domain, right? And the same thing applies if I flip it around because of the principle of duality. So I could say that uh, multiplication in the time domain is the same as convolution in the frequency domain. So for example, there's a property that says that if I have a product in the time domain, that in the frequency domain, I have a convolution. And the place where that comes up the most is when you're doing things like amplitude modulation. So for example, you know, typically in AM, you know, one of these things is a cosine. And then what I get over here is I have a convolution of my original signal convolved with the cosine. And when I convolve a signal with an impulse, I basically get a copy. And so the result of this is basically two half-height copies that are centered at the modulation frequency, right? So if you remember from AM, we did a lot of this thing where you multiply a signal by a cosine, it spreads out the frequency response into these two copies, then you do some filtering and some multiplications by more cosines, and then you bring it back to the, to the baseband. So, you know, that's where we use the multiplication, or I guess you call it the modulation property the most. But we're not going to talk about that too much right now. Okay, so questions or comments about this kind of stuff. So one thing I wanted to show you is just a couple examples of filtering real signals to make things a little bit more concrete. And so for this, I'm going to attempt to play the sound out of, oh, I guess I have to do this. So, all right. So here's a MATLAB demo. Um, let me close this guy up. So this is a little bit of a interface that I wrote a long time ago for, uh, I think I wrote for signals originally, but it will work just as well here. And so here is a sound, which is a dial tone. Something that probably is increasingly foreign to you guys. Uh, so, it's up a little bit. Unclear whether this will ever come out on the speakers on the video, but that's all right. Okay. And so we can see that fundamentally, if I look in the frequency domain, the dial tone is actually made up of two cosines, right? You can kind of see them here. There's one at approximately 350 and one at approximately 440, right? And so what I can do if I want to design a filter is here I have a little interface where I can put the, uh, the break point of the filter, the cutoff frequency, whoops, haha. -ha. Sorry, that's not what I want to do. This is where I put the cutoff frequency. 
so here what I'm doing is I'm making a low-pass filter that just takes out everything below 400. And then I have kind of a mid-pass filter that takes everything between 400 and some other value. And so now if I play just the result of filtering with the low-pass filter, I get one of the cosines. And when I add these things up, I get the dial tone. Right? And so basically what I have is kind of these two cosines that, that make up the signal. And actually the other, um, you know, the other, oops, not this one. Telephone signals are actually similar. So the phone ringing sound is again two cosines if I zoom in. So I can separate those two cosines if I um, am careful here. So it looks like it's about five, I'm going to say 480. Looks like I was a little bit off and I got some of the other cosine. Right, so there's one cosine. And there's the other cosine. And a busy signal is similar, except the busy signal has got basically, uh, you know, this kind of on-off nature, right? And so if you compare the frequency response, or if you compare the Fourier transform of that signal, you can see that compared to the other cosines, my, you know, frequency response or my Fourier transform is a lot kind of noisier looking, right? So what's the reason for that? What was that? Windowing. Right, windowing is what I think about. So what's happening is that, you know, unlike being a continuous signal, right, what I have is I've got that continuous signal, which is the two cosines multiplied by uh, a pulse, right? And I know that the pulse is going to give me basically uh, impulses in the frequency domain. So kind of what I'm going to get is the pulse times the you know, cosines over here corresponds to the two impulses from the cosine convolved with the sync function that's the Fourier transform of the pulse, right? So what I get is basically these are like sync functions that are convolved with the pulses. And so it's a little bit harder for me to separate the, well, I guess I can still try. So if I, right, so there's one of them, there's the other one. It's funny, real, I mean, at least I can't really pick out that there are two component frequencies there. It sounds like kind of this weird thing, but I think it's partially because of the way that the cosines interfere with each other in, in an interesting way. So you don't really perceive it as like playing a chord on a piano. You know, you kind of hear it as this innate sound. Um, another thing, another place where, where you can kind of see things are harmonics, right? So here's a train whistle sound. And so when you have a physical instrument, like a violin or a flute or something like that, you get these kind of resonant frequencies. And here you can see that there are some very strong frequency peaks in the frequency domain. And so I can try and separate those out. Um, so here's one of them. And the other one looks like I could use like a thousand or so. So if I play the low pass and the mid pass and the high pass, I get different parts of the train whistle. and you put them together to get the full thing. Okay, and to make it a little more concrete, so, you know, um, here's a piece of music, okay. Can anyone name this song? No. All right, there you go. So, I wish by Steve Wonder. If anyone says Wild Wild West, then you're out of the class. It's inappropriate. Okay, so you can kind of think about what uh, different parts of the frequency domain correspond to for um, musical signals. And so, if you listen to just like a low pass version of the signal, you're going to get something that is kind of, number one, kind of muffled sounding, and also really includes the bass part, right? So, if you play the low pass version here, You get all the bass stuff. You can't really hear this part. And you don't hear any of the cymbals or anything like that at all, right? All that stuff is up in the high frequencies. The mid pass, the way I've set it up, kind of cuts out most of the beginning part. Still can't hear the cymbals in this one. And the high pass is where all the cymbals are. <laughs> 
You don't hear anything about the beginning part. Right. So basically, you know, music mixing and production is all about kind of changing the frequencies around of these things to make it sound good. Um, here's a slightly more advanced interface I wrote that lets me do a little bit of um, more precise filtering. And so here what I have is a another song. And so, you know, if you want to kind of take the bass boost in your car to amplify it, right? What I would do is, well, you see here in the lower right is kind of like the equivalent of a set of graphic equalizer bars, right? And so one thing that you always want to do in your car as you're pumping down the street is to amplify the bass, right? And so I can kind of, this is like saying I take all of the bass frequencies and I pick them up a lot higher and then I, um, actually maybe I should be a little bit more precise here. Right, so let me, let me bump these guys up here. Yeah, my touch screen uh, control isn't working. All right. So if I apply the filter, so this is the original, and this is the filtered. So here I'm kind of like amping up the bass a little bit. And so what I'm doing here actually, again, this is something that we're going to talk about in a little bit more detail. Uh, we get filter design, but kind of what I'm doing here is I'm designing the I'm designing the filter that I want in the frequency domain. I'm not really paying that much attention to what it looks like in the time domain. Let's think about for a second. Um, you know, if I were to make this a little bit more obvious, so let me let me uh, without really worrying about what the filter is, if I make this thing here. So what I'm trying to do here is to show that as I create this uh, pulse in the frequency domain, what I should be getting is a sync function in the time domain, right? So here, this is my pulse in the frequency domain. I can see it kind of corresponds to that time domain sync that I showed you on paper earlier, right? Okay. And so another reason that I often want to uh, apply filters you know, in addition to just kind of like boosting one region or other, I can also try to remove noise that is bothering me, right? So often, especially in, um, especially in kind of staticky sounds. So here's here's the same thing with a lot of high frequency static on it. And you can kind of see that manifesting itself in the frequency domain as all this crap up here at high frequencies. And so if I wanted to try to remove those things, what I would do is I would say, okay, I'm going to um, kind of damp down everything above a certain frequency in an attempt to remove that noise. Right, so if I apply the filter, this is just like cutting off all that noise up there. And if I play the filtered version, you know, I've, I've made some progress, but I'm also kind of compromising the original sound, right? Part of the reason is that the noisy signal, basically the noise, has kind of a flat frequency response. And that gets added to all the stuff that corresponds to the frequency domain of the original signal. And so in some sense, those two things are innately jumbled together at low frequencies, and I can never really totally undo the high frequency stuff. I can never totally notch it out without compromising the original signal. The only time you can really do that is when you've really contrived something like you know, here's a sound that so this is Darth Vader with a bunch of telephone stuff on him, right? And so if, if I kind of zoom in on the frequency response, I can kind of see that there are some places where there are, you know, high frequency cosine or high energy cosines, right? You can kind of see here, those correspond to where those sounds are. And so I can kind of try to notch out just those sounds by filtering them out just right at those frequencies. Right, so if I filter it now, 
right? So I can kind of get rid of things with a notch filter where I'm just basically, it's like passing all the frequencies except for the ones I say, no, you guys can't come in, right? Um, and if I were a little bit, you know, sloppy, right? If I didn't fully get this guy, then I would have, you know, I, I didn't get rid of that guy fully. Um, so we're going to do, like I said, a bunch of filter design stuff later. And of course, since this is MATLAB, right, all the stuff I'm doing has to be obviously done in the digital domain somehow, right? And so even though I'm treating this like a, you know, even though it looks like these frequencies go all the way up to 10,000 hertz and so on, I have to figure out what is actually going on under the hood in MATLAB to allow me to do this filtering operation, right? And so that's kind of what we're going to talk about next is what is the discrete time Fourier transform, the thing that is actually kind of inside MATLAB. Actually, what MATLAB has is not even the DTFT. It has something called the discrete Fourier transform, which is basically only operating on a finite length signal because I can't have infinitely long signals in MATLAB. So we have to find a way, number one, to take the idea of the Fourier transform, which operates on a kind of infinitely long continuous time signal, turn that into something that operates on an infinitely long discrete time signal, and then turn that into something that works on a finitely long discrete time signal, right? And by the time we're done with that process, hopefully you'll understand all the connections between the four different kinds of Fourier transforms that we talked about. And finally, we'll bring up the Z transform, which is kind of like the discrete time equivalent of the Laplace transform, and that also fits in as well. Okay. So, any questions or comments? I guess I ended kind of early today, but that's all right. Um, okay, so um, in that case, for those of you that didn't get your homework back, I'll hand it back now.